All right, good afternoon, everyone. So great to see you all in person and on Zoom. My name is Tamia Hackworth, and I'm a 2L serving as the co-chair of the Black Law Student Association this academic year. Thank you for joining us for the 29th annual Valerie Gordon Human Rights Lecture, co-hosted by BALSA and the Program on Human Rights and the Global Economy. I'd like to offer a special welcome to our honorary guests, the members of Valerie Gordon's family here with us on Zoom. We are thrilled to have Mr. Christian Lamar, who was Valerie Gordon's husband, the Reverend Dr. Carolyn Gordon, sister of Valerie Gordon, Catherine Jones, and Dolores Johnson. I would also like to issue a warm welcome to our keynote speaker, Margaret Wong from the Southern Poverty Law Center. We have a fabulous program for you all this afternoon. The lecture features outstanding lawyers, judges, scholars, and advocates who share their experiences in advancing human rights. Okay. So I'm excited and happy to formally welcome you to this event. And now I will ask the Dean of the Law School, Dean Hackney, to come forward and give the opening remarks. Testing, folks can hear me? Great. Uh, first, uh, Kristen and Valerie, you wanna say hi? Uh, Carolyn, Carolyn, sorry. Kristen and Carolyn, hey. say hi. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Glad Good to afternoon. see everyone and happy to be here on Zoom. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person this year. Dr. Gordon. Good afternoon. I am uh, absolutely happy to be here. I'm sorry also that I could not be there in person. It was my plan to be there, but we're here and we are excited and celebrating with you. Thank you. So uh, definitely to have your uh, presence uh, here. I'm going to speak a bit about Valerie uh, Gordon and this uh, lecture and then uh, pass it on to the rest of the uh, uh, activities and our um, keynote speaker. Um, this is, as was said, the 29th annual Valley Gordon uh, lecture. So that's basically 30 uh, years, three uh, decades. Um, and I was fortunate enough to have been um, here when Valerie was a student. Um, so it tells you that I've been here for a little bit over uh, three uh, decades. Um, Valerie was um, a wonderful person, really uh, kind of force of nature. She had a smile that would light up this entire uh, room um, and a presence that would uh, fuel and energize this uh, entire room. And that presence and what Valerie stood for and what this lecture series uh, stands for was really at the kind of core and uh, spirit of the law school. Uh, she was a fierce uh, proponent of social justice, uh, human rights. She was very close with uh, Hope Lewis, uh, who was one of our leading human rights faculty uh, members who uh, sadly uh, passed uh, away. Uh, and that activism was very much present here uh, at the law school. So uh, Valerie was one of the leaders of our proud Kemet chapter of uh, Balsa. Uh, she was also a leader of the Student of Color uh, Coalition. Uh, and before my time, they famously um, sat in the dean's suite, or held to sit in, in the dean's suite to uh, argue for further 
diversifying uh, the faculty. Hence my presence here. <laughs> And you know, Kristen can attest to this. That was an amazing kind of year in which um, we had, uh, you know, quite a few faculty of color who came in in a critical uh, mass. So that was very amazing and a tribute to the activism of Valerie and Kristen and the other students uh, at that time. Uh, yeah, Valerie was um, a journalist, anti-racism and women's rights uh, activist. Uh, she met Christian while here uh, and they were uh, married and um, very much appreciate uh, that union. You know, this lecture has really come to the kind of status of uh, being um, one of the signature moments uh, at the law school and has a lot of, at this point in time, historical significance. This being, again, the 29th of these lectures, which means that 28 uh, uh, folks uh, preceded in terms of keynote uh, speakers. I'll give the names of just a few before we transition to uh, Margaret Wang, who we are most privileged to have with us today as president and CEO of the Southern Poverty Law Center and all the great work that um, they're doing. But just a few of the predecessors, uh, Margaret um, Desima Williams, former UN ambassador to Grenada, um, the Honorable Nathaniel, late Honorable Nathaniel R. Jones, who I had the privilege of meeting on a couple of occasions. You talk about a real force of nature. Um, the Honorable Al B. Sachs, former judge of the Constitutional Court of South Africa, and uh, Brian Stevenson, a claim lawyer and social justice uh, advocate. So, um, not that the pressure's not on, but we know that you're well uh, up to the, uh, the task. So without further ado, um, I wanna thank you all for joining us and turn it over to BALSA co-chair, Marissa Spalding. Marissa. Hear me? <laughs> Louder? Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon, distinguished guests, faculty, and students. My name is Marissa Spaulding, and I have the honor and privilege of serving as one of the co chairs of the Black Law Students Association Balsa Tenant Chapter here at NUSO. This year makes 29 years, as Dean Hackney and Tamia have stated earlier, since the annual Valerie Gordon Human Rights Lecture began. Typically, this lecture includes an essay contest known as the Spirit of Valerie Gordon Book Award, which has been traditionally reserved for first year members of our Balsa Kemet chapter. This year, we have reached an inflection point in our history of the essay contest to allow room to re-envision the contest and consider ways to make it more impactful going forward. In lieu of an essay contest this year, we would like to take a moment to pay tribute to Valerie Gordon, reminisce on her accomplishments and her legacy, and share some examples of how our Balsa Kemet chapter has continued Valerie Gordon's excellent legacy to keep her memory alive. It is such an honor to stand before you all to pay tribute to Valerie Gordon, who is such an incredible individual. Valerie Gordon graduated from NUSO in 1993. She was a highly respected and valued member of this law school community. Prior to law school, she was a journalist and a longtime anti-racism and women rights activist. 
Her background in journalism and activism set her apart from her classmates. She attended law school during a period of heightened activism on law school campuses when students were concerned about the issues of recruiting and retaining students and faculty of color. She rose to the occasion by channeling her considerable advocacy skills to lead the charge to promote the coverage and treatment of issues of race within the law school. Valerie Gordon was an active and dedicated member of our Boston Kemet chapter, and she co-founded the Students of Color Coalition, also known as the SCC. She used both platforms to effectively advocate for increasing diversity here at NUSO, both in student enrollment and faculty hiring. She advocated for an end to institutional racism and an acknowledgement of race, culture, and difference in the law school curriculum. The students at the time felt that their racial issues were not being addressed in the first year curriculum and that some professors were not receptive to these concerns. Valerie Gordon and Christian Lamar, who was also another member of the class of 1993, whom she met and married during law school, were among the student leaders who fiercely organized the 1991 walkout with the support of Balsa, Lalsa, Apalsa, and progressive white students among the first year class of 1993 to demand change. For those who do not know, the 1991 walkout was when students stood up during one of their criminal law lectures while the professor was speaking and began chanting, no more silence, as they exited the classroom and proceeded to march through the halls of Musa. On the day after the walkout, Valerie Gordon, Christian Lamar, and the other student leaders discussed their list of demands with the Newsol administration. The demands included the need for more students of color, the need for more TAs of color, and the need for more faculty of color. Valerie Gordon, along with other leaders of the walkout, proposed the idea of a mandatory course for first year students centered on issues of diversity. The demands were met approximately a year later when Newsol hired three faculty members of color, including Dean James Hackney. Notably, the 1991 walkout birthed the Law, Culture, and Difference course, which evolved into what we know as Legal Skills in Social Context, or LSSC. The, though the LSSC course went through a lot of iterations, faculty present during this period have expressed that Valerie Gordon was influential in, le in leading students of color and allies in pushing Newsol to increase the discussion and coverage of issues of race across the curriculum. Some faculty remember Valerie Gordon for her exceptional advocacy skills, presenting her stance persuasively and holding strong to her positions while operating from a place of strength to insist that Nusa move in the direction that it should. Those who knew her believed that Valerie Gordon would become a powerful superstar lawyer, arguing at the Supreme Court. Some sources have shared that she was a very pleasant individual and that the SCC developed because she gravitated to others across race and gender lines, which made others feel comfortable with her. People saw something very promising in Valerie Gordon based on what she accomplished here at Nusul and beyond. Sadly, she did not have the opportunity to further effectuate change in the world because of her untimely death shortly after the birth of hers and Christian Lamar's son, Faluke. Valerie Gordon's death was a tremendous loss to the Nusu community and social justice. She embodied a spirit that inspired the Nusu community and student activism. Her efforts proved that students, through a collective power, can bring about institutional change. This is the type of legacy that students should be reminded of, and it, and it has been captured through this annual Valerie Gordon Human Rights Lecture Series. Valerie Gordon's contributions and legacy remain integral to our Balsa Kemet chapter. She paved the way for our chapter to advocate for many structural changes, to enhance the educational experiences and opportunities for black students and other minority law students. In recent years, our Balsa Kemet chapter has advocated for the necessary resources and tools required to level the playing field for BIPOC law students. The Kemet chapter continues to honor Valerie Gordon's legacy by advocating for additional review sessions for first year members to receive the resources and support needed to achieve their maximum poten potential
here at NUSU and in the legal profession. Shortly after, our Kemet chapter's efforts led to additional <laughs> sessions for the larger BIPOC community. Following the feedback from BIPOC students in 2021 regarding the LSSC program, BALSA collaborated with other BIPOC student organizations in a call to action on the NUSU administration to radically reimagine what it means to study, practice, and innovate the law. <laughs> Together, this coalition of student organizations collected over 220 signatures from past, present, and future NUSU students to call out the NUSU administration on their patterns of forestalling material change. Their bold efforts led to the creation of the Assistant Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion position and an LSSC Program Director position in 2021. On a personal note, I have been personally inspired by Valerie Gordon's legacy and impact here at NUSU. As a Black law student, I have been fortunate to benefit from the programs and resources that sprung from Valerie Gordon's efforts. Her impact is recognized by all of us here, and I'm confident that our Balsa Kemet chapter will continue to advance Valerie Gordon's legacy and keep her memory alive. To the Gordon family, Christian Lamar, Faluke, and Reverend Dr. Carolyn Gordon, thank you all for giving us the gift that is Valerie Gordon. Testing, can you hear me? Good afternoon. My name is Elizabeth Ennin. I am the director of the Program on Human Rights and the Global Economy, known by its initials PHRGE or FERGE. I've heard it pronounced many ways, but we tend to use FERGE. Um, on behalf of FERGE, I want to thank all of you for being with us here today. It's a very special occasion. I'd like to start with an exciting announcement about FERGE, if I may. In the very near future, the law school will be launching a new center of excellence, the, the Center for Global Law and Justice which will be led by Martha Davis and Zena Miller. Yes. When the new center launches, Fergie will live on. It will live on as an initiative under the umbrella of that exciting new center. So the new center will have a soft launch in, within the next month. And then we will have a hard launch in the fall with a very special event. And we hope to see many of you at that launch event in the fall, so please stay tuned. Fergie is very proud to co-sponsor this event with the Black Law Students Association. As I've mentioned to the people I've been working with this year, it is one of the highlights of my work here at the law school. It is truly such a joy. Um, I want to call out and, 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 and signal for thanks to Mia and Marissa, from whom you've already heard, you've already seen, that they're extraordinary people. I do not know how the two of you do everything that you do, and I'm so grateful for it. And the entire law school is grateful for all of the work that you do. Thank you so very much. I'd also like to thank Antoinette Copley. This is, uh, Antoinette is this year's uh, faculty advisor for BALSA, and it's our first year working together. And I wanna thank you for your dedication to this event and your incredibly warm support of all of our efforts. Thank you for making it as wonderful as it is. Um, I will also, I'd also like to thank the following students, Rakeb Abraham, Tia Martin, Noel Gulick, and Nora Doherty. They are playing various roles today and we couldn't do the event without them. So thank you very, very much. The Gordon family, this event would not be what it is without you. Your allegiance to the law school, your commitment to being represented here every year for 29 years means the world to us. You make this event very, very special. I'd just like to, to point out that Christian Lamar, who is here every year, he flies up from Atlanta to represent the family in person. The only reason he's not here today is he's in the middle of a jury trial. I think the fact that he is here with us on Zoom is a small miracle. Yes. Christian, thank you so, so, so much. <laughs> Thank 
It is now my pleasure and honor to introduce to you our keynote speaker for this year's Valerie Gordon event, Margaret Huang, the Executive Director of the Southern Poverty Law Center. The Southern Poverty Law Center, or SPLC, was founded in 1971. It is based in Montgomery, Alabama, and it has offices throughout the South. It is one of the most important and effective legal advocacy organizations in this country. One of the striking things about the SPLC is the ambition of its goals, which include the following, catalyzing racial justice in the South, dismantling white supremacy, ending the overcriminalization of black and brown communities, eradicating poverty and racial economic inequality, strengthening intersectional movements, and advancing the human rights of all. It takes someone with extraordinary skills, knowledge, experience, and judgment to lead an organization with that daunting list of goals. The SPL SPLC found such a person when they brought Margaret Huang on board in 2020 to serve as the executive director. Prior to arriving at the, at the SPLC, Ms. Huang worked as the executive director of Amnesty International USA and served in important roles at Global Rights, the Robert F. Kennedy Center for Human Rights, the Asia, and the Asian Foundation. She also served as a committee staff member for the U.S. Senate Foreign, and Foreign Relations Committee. Ms. Huang has deep expertise in human rights and is committed these days in particular to promoting human rights in the United States. If you would like more information about her theoretical work in this area, I suggest you read her article, Going Global, Appeals to International and Regional Human Rights Bodies, which you can find in Bringing Human Rights Home from Civil Rights to Human Rights, edited by our very own Martha Davis. With respect to Ms. Huang's human rights advocacy work, I could go on for hours, but I'll simply note here that her experience is vast. She has successfully protected and promoted the human rights of, among others, migrants, refugees, asylum seekers, torture survivors, the victims of gun violence, transgender youth, activists, and protesters. <clears throat> human rights in the United States. I cannot imagine a more timely topic, and I cannot imagine a better person to address it. Please welcome our keynote speaker, Margaret Huang, who will speak on the topic of the necessity of and struggle for a human rights movement in the United States. Welcome. How's that for sound? Excellent. All right. Thank you so much. We'll see if I can manage technology <laughs> at the same time. What a distinct honor it is to be part of the Valerie Gordon experience today. And I do feel a little intimidated by the list of people who have come before me. It is really, truly flattering to be added to that list. Um, I really want to thank Dean Hackney, the Kemet chapter of Balsa, Elizabeth, and the entire program team at the Program on Human Rights and the Global Economy. And of course, all of you for the very warm welcome I've received today. I know that Newsel has a storied legacy in human rights activism and passionate belief in social justice. And it is such an inspiration to me as somebody who tries to think every day about how to advance more of that kind of spirit and activism across the country. So I love being in your company and I thank you for the chance to talk with you all today. I also want to acknowledge the family of Valerie Gordon, uh, Kristen Lamar and Dr. Gordon and all of the family members who've joined us. As a law student and as a professional, she really inspired a more just world. And I am so moved by this incredible 29 year legacy that is ongoing um, and that continues to inspire the activism of her family and this community in so many ways. Now, before we begin, I'd actually like to start, if I can, by sharing a short video about the Southern Poverty Law Center and to give you a sense of who we are, the communities that we work alongside, and the issues that we fight for every day. Let's see if we can make it work. <laughs> In June of 1969, 
two black children walked into their local YMCA in Montgomery, Alabama to enroll in summer camp. They were turned away because of their race. Like other cities across the Deep South in the 1960s, Montgomery closed swimming pools, parks, and playgrounds rather than follow court orders to integrate them. The YMCA helped fill the city's recreational needs, but continued to segregate children based on race. That's when our co-founders sued and later won. The court ruled that the YMCA must end its policy of racial discrimination. The case laid the foundation for the Southern Poverty Law Center, becoming a bellwether of our cases to come. While the nation celebrated passage of landmark civil rights laws in the 1950s and the 1960s, the promise of these laws did not always guarantee real protection in people's lives. Resistance to progress was strong. Racial discrimination and violence cast long shadows in the South. Black, brown, Asian, and indigenous people, and others historically pushed to the margins, were still excluded from good jobs, adequate housing, quality education, and other opportunities. And they had little recourse to demand justice. Our co-founders, Joe Levin and Morris Dees, sought to change that. In 1971, they formally incorporated the Southern Poverty Law Center and named civil rights leader Julian Bond as president. In the decades that followed, we took on cases that few others at the time were willing to pursue. Cases that tested civil rights laws, held powerful institutions accountable, and challenged and even bankrupted the most hateful organizations in the South. SPLC also launched programs to prevent hate from taking root in the first place. Today, that legacy of fighting for racial equity and civil rights in the Deep South is more important than at any time in modern history. Extremists are growing bolder and have pushed white supremacist ideology back into the mainstream. Lawmakers and the courts are reversing progress and rescinding rights that were once thought to be unassailable, like the right to bodily autonomy and the right to vote. This moment demands action. It demands that we act within our collective power to make change. That's why, under new leadership, the Southern Poverty Law Center is building power for a multiracial, inclusive democracy to ensure the promise of equal justice is real for all. Alongside our litigation efforts, we are leading transformational change through community organizing and outreach, policy advocacy, tracking and reporting on hate and extremism, and shaping narratives. And we're living into our values through four priority areas, strengthening democracy and civic engagement, relegating white supremacy out of the mainstream, decarcerating and decriminalizing communities of color, and eradicating poverty. At the heart of this evolution are the communities we work alongside and the region we call home. We're embracing more fully than ever our roots in the Deep South. We have opened state offices starting in Mississippi and Alabama to serve as connection points between SPLC and the communities we seek to serve and to lift up community voices, needs, and priorities. Together, we're organizing for racial equity and shifting power to black and brown people in the South. Even while looking to the future, we remain grounded in the past. So much of our nation's progress on racial justice in the last century has been born out of black leadership and activism and the ongoing civil rights movement, especially in the South. We honor that history. We are inspired by that history. And as we look to the future, we embrace the powerful lesson that history holds. When we transform the South, we transform the nation. Join us. I hope that sets the stage a little bit for our conversation today. I've actually served as the president and CEO for nearly four years, which is rather amazing. I started at the beginning of COVID and it's been a time when, as the video notes, hate and extremism has been on the rise, when state houses, especially in the South, have been rescinding rights and opportunities, and when economic inequality is reaching staggering new levels. The question is, how did we get here? 
after a century of notable advances of civil and political rights, how strong does the US commitment to human rights appear today? And why is it that people's access to opportunity, basic services, and the ability to get on solid economic footing feels so far out of reach? There are, of course, a myriad number of ways to explore this question, but I'm particularly interested today in understanding it through the lens of the right to housing. I believe that so much is possible for our history, for our communities and our democracy, if we're able to bring human rights home. But to do that, to finally build a sustained, successful human rights movement in the United States, we have to first understand the historical forces that have limited our ability to imagine and make real those principles within our own borders. I wanna begin the discussion today um, by acknowledging historian and author, Dr. Carol Anderson, and a little bit of a fangirl. Her research and book, Eyes Off the Prize, have deeply influenced my thinking on this. And I know she was a 2006 honoree of the Valerie Gordon Award. So again, uh, delighted to be following in her footsteps. And if you haven't already read her book, Eyes Off the Prize, I really encourage you to pick it up. We're gonna start by going back in time and back to the late 1940s, just after the end of World War II. The Allied powers heralded a victory as a triumph for democracy and a blow to fascism. As the United States celebrated the end of World War II, black veterans returning from Europe received a very different homecoming, especially in the South. Their heroism was met with brutal violence, lynchings, and Jim Crow. They risked and lost their lives to defend democracy and human rights overseas, only to have them viciously denied when they returned to their own soil. For many, it was the final straw in, play, in playing appeasement politics with white leaders. They wanted justice, equality, and freedom without delay. And so black veterans across the South showed up to the polls to vote. They stood up to the bullying. They refused to be relegated to the back of the bus, the back of the line, the back of civil society. White Southerners were enraged by these bold claims to equality. As more horrific reports of beatings, maimings, and lynchings of black veterans reached the leaders of the NAACP and other black freedom groups, they implored the federal government to act. But even as they pushed for anti-lynching legislation, which we still have not seen in this country, and legal intervention by the White House and Justice Department, they knew that such actions would not be enough to allow black Americans to live safely, freely, and with dignity. For that, they needed to achieve both legal protection and economic justice and opportunity. At every turn though, the Truman administration told them that social equality was a step too far. Meanwhile, in the UN charter deliberations in San Francisco, the US government was in discussion with other nations to ensure that the horrors of the Holocaust would never happen again. After the failure of the League of Nations to prevent another world war, they needed to develop a new body to secure international peace and cooperation among nations. But as US leaders were negotiating over the founding UN charter, it became more and more clear that they would push for a body with no teeth, with no real enforcement power, to make sure that the racial apartheid within US borders would not be investigated on the international stage. Black leaders like Walter White of the NAACP and W.E.B. Du Bois closely followed these deliberations, understanding just how interconnected the liberation of black Americans was with the liberation of colonized and oppressed peoples worldwide. They demanded a presence at the negotiating table 
on the UN Charter. The State Department and Eleanor Roosevelt granted their request, but only, as they soon realized, as window dressing. Their presence was part of the State Department's PR campaign. At every turn, their lobbying for strong human rights and accountability language in the Charter was rejected. Even Eleanor Roosevelt, a supposed ally to Black leadership, told them to stand down. She argued that a human rights plank would jeopardize the entire treaty. Tensions with the Soviet Union and hysteria around communism were already escalating. And the US government did not want to give any foreign power a domestic weakness to exploit or humiliate. Plus the pillars of social equality that black leaders knew were essential to their liberation like access to good jobs and education and healthcare were painted as communist propaganda. The final UN charter that passed with merely the bones of what could have held such substance and such hope for black Americans and colonized people worldwide. As massacres in the South continued and perpetrators went unpunished, black leaders tried to petition the UN directly they had exhausted every avenue in the United States, and they knew that the international human rights structure was vital for addressing racial discrimination. Historian Herbert Apsiker drafted an eight page report detailing the nightmare of white supremacy that black Americans were forced to endure in the United States. His report concluded that the cancer of racism had spread its poison throughout the life of America, throttling and killing the entire nation. W.E.B. Du Bois followed this report with a lengthy legal treatise of his own that further outlined the UN's obligation to intervene. But after years of exhaustive efforts, their plans were again thwarted. At the pleading of Eleanor Roosevelt and others, the UN refused to take these petitions seriously and black leaders were forced to abandon the human rights strategy altogether. And that's when they turned their attention toward achieving a much narrower scope of civil and political rights. When I think about where we are today in the context of this history, I'm reminded of the saying that if a butterfly flaps its wings in the Amazon, it can change the weather a half a world away. The rejection of the NAACP petition, human rights petition at the UN, nearly eight decades ago, continues to have significant influence on our nation's human rights exercise today. As movement leaders in the 1930s and 1940s both foresaw and feared, a long-standing prioritization of political rights means that now, today, there is no right to a minimum level of subsistence, no right to a minimum level of care in the United States. Let's consider the consequence of this through the issue of housing. As all of you know, where we live matters. Where we call home matters. It matters for our safety. It matters for feeling seen and valued by our neighbors. It matters for future opportunities for our children. It matters for accessing healthy soil, breathable air, and safe drinking water. And increasingly, it matters for how much voice we have in shaping our democracy. It's no secret that we've long been a country of justice by geography, that racial discrimination in housing has long been entrenched through local, state, and federal policies. The COVID pandemic exacerbated and exposed these inequalities as 40 million people in America suddenly faced the terrible threat of eviction. But interestingly, the pandemic also presented an opportunity for social change. It became a unique moment when the nation experienced a collective social safety net. 
It was only because of emergency rental and mortgage relief, the federal eviction moratorium, and a patchwork of state and local protections that many people were able to stay in their homes. These emergency orders marked the very first time that our government tied access to housing to public health. The law at last acknowledged how losing our homes can leave us vulnerable to sickness and other harmful outcomes. Since those protections have expired, evictions are now on the rise again. For example, the city of Atlanta experienced 70,000 evictions in the first six months of 2023. Housing prices have significantly outpaced inflation. Meanwhile, recent reports have found that renters must make double the federal minimum wage, and in some cases, most cases, usually more, to afford a two bedroom house in any state in the country. In 2023, a big jump in homelessness was due to people experiencing a loss of housing for the first time because of the affordability crisis. For every $100 increase in rent, there has been a 9% increase in the homeless population. As those movement leaders argued so long ago, the consequences of human rights crises like inadequate access to safe and stable housing touch nearly every aspect of our lives. The racial wealth gap remains stubbornly in place, a gap that is largely attributable to federal housing policy throughout the 20th century. That further narrows educational and employment opportunities for historically marginalized populations. It also compounds the healthcare crisis as black people receive second rate care and grow sicker at higher rates than their white counterparts. And now more people are being forced onto the streets left with no options for affordable housing at all. As the visibility of the unhoused population grows, so too does the public backlash. At the SPLC, we're deeply concerned by the intensifying criminalization of unhoused people, an already displaced population due to mass housing deprivation. New laws across the country are punishing people for engaging in life-sustaining behavior, like sleeping in a public place. Punishments range from fines to jail time, all premised on the misguided belief that we can end homelessness if we simply make it a crime, as though homelessness were a personal choice or a personal failure, instead of a predictable consequence of treating housing as a privilege instead of a human right. The SPLC is taking on these cases, and in doing so, we are surfacing just how deeply rooted in history the justifications are for allowing people to languish. In 2020, we filed a lawsuit alongside the ACLU of Alabama and the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty in a case called Singleton versus the City of Montgomery over the constitutionality of two Alabama statutes that criminalized publicly asking for help or panhandling. The law subjected people to fines and jail time for asking for charitable assistance. In an 18 month period, the city of Montgomery issued 400 citations under these statutes. One of our clients pictured here was cited and arrested six times for holding signs with messages like homeless, Today it is me, tomorrow it could be you. This client struggled with chronic illness, including kidney failure and diabetes, which made it difficult to maintain employment, housing and healthcare access. He relied on the help of others to survive. And for that, the state of Alabama wanted to punish him and make him pay. There's clear legal precedent that these types of restrictions violate the right to free speech under the First Amendment. It is the same constitutional right 
that guarantees the abil ability of organizations like the SPLC to educate people about our work and to ask for financial support. We reach settlements with the city of Montgomery and the local sheriff, but the state police have appealed after the district court entered an injunction. This is a little quote from the state of Alabama's opening brief in this Singleton case. On appeal to the 11th circuit, Alabama is arguing that this long line of legal precedent should be overturned by relying on a history of vagrancy laws during our nation's founding era and Elizabethan poor laws before that. This history systematically denied people experiencing poverty all civil, political, and social rights and was used particularly in the US South to keep newly emancipated people in a state of economic and racial subjugation after 1866. We argue that this pernicious history has already been rejected by the Supreme Court and should not be revived again here. But we are awaiting the 11th Circuit's decision. In the meantime, in just two weeks, the US Supreme Court will hear the most significant case on the rights of people experiencing homelessness that has come before the court in decades. The case, Johnson versus City of Grants Pass, asks whether it's constitutional for state and local governments to punish people who are forced to sleep outside, even when they have no other place to go. The court has already ruled that people in America have no right to housing, no right to shelter, no right to a minimum social safety net. A person sleeping on the street is the most visible manifestation of that denial, of the promise of human rights unfulfilled. Rather than approach this from a human rights framework, local governments across the country are turning to criminal penalties. As if, again, burdening people with fines, criminal records, and maybe even jail time will solve the problem of homelessness. Let's be clear, until safe housing and an adequate standard of living are recognized as rights and made available to those in need, people will have no choice but to sleep outside. It is alarming that we are seeing similar arguments emerge in this case as we are seeing in the Singleton case in Alabama. They center on how poor people never really had rights at the founding of the Constitution and therefore should have no rights today. Even more concerning is the same justifications are being used to legitimize vagrancy laws and they're finding new life in these cases. The idea that poverty is synonymous with criminality. The SPLC has submitted an amicus brief on behalf of our organization and six other poverty law organizations, all working in Florida, to aid the court with our background representing people experiencing homelessness and poverty. Florida's experience is particularly relevant as the state with the third largest total population of individuals experiencing homelessness and the second largest unsheltered population in the United States. Our brief argues that it is a cruel and unusual punishment in violation of the Eighth Amendment to punish a person for sleeping outside when there are no indoor alternatives. Sleeping, like breathing, is simply existing. Punishing someone for sleeping criminalizes the status of homelessness because only people without housing have no choice but to violate the law. Further, we make the case that the history of vagrancy laws, especially in the U.S. Deep South, are intertwined with a system of economic and racial subordination that is incompatible with the rule of law. This is an example of how the SPLC is using the imperfect tools of constitutional litigation to move the needle on human rights here at home. We are leveraging civil and political rights in courts to advance economic rights. We can't go in and directly enforce a right to housing, but we can push forward litigation 
or policies <clears throat> that will progressively advance these rights. In these cases, we're doing so on behalf of people who have experienced the deprivation of the human right to housing. And then they're being punished by the government because they don't have housing. This work demonstrates that human rights are interdependent and indivisible, that economic rights are essential to the fulfillment of our civil and political rights. And all of this brings us to the question, how can we at last cultivate a robust human rights movement here in the United States? I have four recommendations. First, we must push for the establishment of a national human rights institution, or NHRI, a long phrase. Without it, the requirements of international human rights treaties are rarely, if ever, considered in the development or implementation of domestic policy. Our nation's failure to establish an NHRI is a global outlier, particularly among the more developed democratic nations around the world. At the start of 2023, there have been, there are 110 national human rights institutions recorded around the world. They've been established on every continent by every major ally and in every country of the Americas, except the United States and Brazil. We're in desperate need of that accountability. The SPLC and other civil and human rights groups are hard at work advocating for an NHRI to protect and, human, uh, and promote human rights within our borders. Second, and this is for all of you, we must cite, 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 okay. There are two landmark U.S. Supreme Court decisions in the last two decades that cited international law, not as justifying reasons for the ruling, but as additional context for arguments derived driving the decision. In the first, Lawrence v. Texas, the court found that it was unconstitutional to criminalize intimate sexual content, conduct between two consenting adults of the same sex. In the majority opinion, Justice Anthony Kennedy noted that the European Court of Human Rights had affirmed the right of adults to engage in intimate consensual activity. The opinion also concluded that the right in question had been, quote, accepted as an integral part of human freedom in many other countries. In the second decision, Roper v. Simmons, the court held that it is unconstitutional to impose the death penalty for crimes committed by children under the age of 18. Our friend, Justice Kennedy, once again authored that decision and acknowledged that the United States was the only country in the world that continues to give official sanction to the juvenile death penalty. He went on to cite amicus briefs filed by human rights organizations citing the UN Convention on the Rights of Children. Every country in the world has ratified that UN convention, except the United States and Somalia. The court noted that parallel prohibitions against executing children were in other international covenants, finding that this demonstrates that the US now stands alone in a world that has turned its face against the juvenile death penalty. This is a powerful strategy for advocating for a human rights framework in the United States. Mm -hmm. If you are litigating a case, if you are writing an amicus brief, if you are leading any legal advocacy, please cite international law and treaties at least as supplemental reasoning in your arguments. Someday that citation will matter. It will help create a record in which judges acknowledge that there are legal obligations to adhere to outside of current US law. Third, we must argue human rights principles in our advocacy. Just as it's important to cite international law in our legal cases, it's also crucial that we lift up our obligations to human rights treaties when we're advocating with state and local leaders, federal policymakers, and more. At the federal level, for example, we know that not every presidential administration takes international obligations seriously, but the Biden administration does. When we have talked to them about our obligations, they have paid attention. 
The SPLC has had productive discussions with the White House and with a number of agency officials, particularly at the um, Department of Housing and Urban Development and the Department of Education about the need to implement UN recommendations. And we're seeing movement in that direction. We also held a congressional briefing on human rights treaty implementation last month with the ACLU and the Center for Reproductive Rights. It was well attended and actually sparked interest from both House and Senate members as it was the first such briefing since January 2017. While there may not be immediate payoff, this groundwork for normalizing human rights advocacy will in the long term ensure that human rights principles are more than hollow words and decorative wall art in the United States. Lastly, we have to build public awareness and momentum for change. I've always believed that the only way for human rights to have meaning is when we collectively demand the protection of everyone's rights. Whether that's working in coalition across sectors and disciplines, collaborating with partners, or working alongside our communities. Right now, there is far too little awareness about the US's human rights obligations under international treaties. And if we don't act now, the situation will only grow worse. In the last two years alone, state legislators have introduced or passed hundreds of bills to impose ignorance in schools and block the truthful teaching of history. I know folks in this room understand the grave implications of legislations like this. It is imperative for the health of our communities and our democracy that we preserve inclusive learning environments and continue to promote the importance of accurate history teaching and public memory. The Southern Poverty Law Center's program, Learning for Justice, provides social justice educational resources and trains educators to teach hard history. They're also leading with a conviction that we have to create new models for learning to recognize schools as part of communities and create new possibilities for learning that happen outside of school walls. Education is central to the protection of our democracy. It is essential that we work alongside our communities to teach our shared history and educate students of all ages and backgrounds about human rights. If we can be innovative in thinking about how to educate the broader public, we can collectively put more pressure on lawmakers to take human rights seriously and enforce those treaties in our country. Before I close, I want to note that I am particularly excited for the young people in the room today who are embarking, I hope, on careers in human rights. When I went to school to study human rights, I understood that I was choosing an international career path. It wasn't until a decade later that I realized that I could do this work domestically. It's clear that this false delineation is already fading. Movements by young people today that raise human rights concerns are erasing much of the border sovereignty issues that existed when I was growing up in this space. From environmental justice, to Black Lives Matter, to women's rights. Opportunities are arising to break down national sovereignty, to link arms across borders, and to prioritize our shared humanity and our shared rights. I am thrilled by the possibilities emergency, emerging from this leadership, from your leadership. Thank you all again for your work and for carrying the torch for human rights at home and abroad. And thank you for this honor. I'm going to end and I look forward to our conversation. Thank you. Sure.
Thank you again, Ms. Wong, for that lovely talk. I have here lots of folks have questions. We'll be taking questions from Zoom as well. Oh, okay. I just have to. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we'll open it up here first. Do folks have questions that they'd like to ask? Yes. Um, do you have any advice for law students who are hoping to promote human rights to our work? Sure. I'm going to repeat the questions in case people on, on the video can't hear. Do I have any advice for law students about pursuing a career in human rights? I have all kinds of advice all the time. So first of all, what's really amazing today is that human rights mean so many more things than they did 20, 30 years ago. And you can do human rights work in a myriad of ways that I never would have dreamed of before. So the key is to find something that you feel so passionately about that it actually doesn't feel like work, that you're excited that you're getting paid to go do something you would wanna do anyway. And that could be in a whole host of different issue areas. It could be working for a local organization. It could be doing human rights education. It could be doing advocacy and it could definitely be doing litigation. There are many organizations doing human rights litigation right now, and I'm delighted that the Southern Poverty Law Center is citing more and more international human rights treaties in our work. But there are many other organizations that do that. And so the key is to actually talk about why human rights are important to you as you're doing informational interviews, as you're going to talk to organizations about their work, so that we're really building a sense of inevitability about that but also happy to talk more after if you'd like some more specifics. Thanks. Any other questions? Any on Zoom? Hi, I'm curious um, if you think there'll be any change in, in what I believe, which is may not be accurate, that uh, as a lawyer, you have to exhaust your national remedies before the going international. You can add a claim in your pleadings, but you have to go through our Supreme Court, right? Yeah. And exhaust our national remedies. That has been the longstanding practice. So the question is about the obligation to exhaust domestic remedies before you can seek uh, remedy outside in an international court. We don't even have that many international courts that the U.S. has access to, so um, it's even tougher for us than, for example, our peers or colleagues in the European or American system. That said, yes, that is the case today, um, but I have to believe there are other international treaties that the U.S. is a party to that don't make those same requirements. They happen to be in the area of trade. There are many mechanisms where under international trade law, parties can actually go directly to an external mechanism. So it's not that it's not possible, it's that it's been set up intentionally that way. And those are things that can be changed if public interest and activism pushes us to move in that direction. So someday, someday we'll get there. Thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. A question on Zoom. How can the movement for human rights cities and related initiatives like cities for CEDAW play a role in building momentum for a national human rights institution in the US? What a great question. Thank you. So there are a number of cities across the country who have adopted this approach, trying to get a local city to embrace and actually ratify an international human rights treaty. One of the most common is the Treaty on the Rights of Women, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, or CEDAW, because that is a mouthful. Right. And many uh, cities across the country and around the world have done that. I think it's a wonderful opportunity. One of the first cities in our country to do that was actually the city of San Francisco. They took it very seriously. And what it meant was that the city agencies had to all review all of their day-to-day -day work and look at how it impacted men and women differently. 
And so the city infrastructure people had to think about where lighting could make a big difference for both women and men feeling safe walking around the city, or what kind of security needs we might need on public transportation for women who had to travel late at night by themselves. And so the entire city looked at day-to-day -day operations and said, hmm, maybe these decisions we've always assumed have really been for men have to be looked at again in the context of asking, do women or people who identify as women need different support services? So that's been an incredible opportunity. And I hope that as we go forward, if more and more cities are embracing that approach, whether that's adopting CEDAW, the Women's Treaty, or the Convention on the Rights of the Child, or any of the other international conventions, it raises awareness. It educates the population on why that's important. And it creates a whole new constituency for why human rights matter here in the United States. So I think it's a wonderful approach. And just noting universities can do it too. <laughs> One other question on Zoom. Thank you so much for your talk. I appreciate so much the focus on housing as a human right. Are there other legal avenues besides a human rights model that you think would work, are working to help build affordable housing in the US? Oh, that's so important. And obviously the human rights framework is particularly important for the litigation approach, but there's so much work to be done outside of litigation as well. Um, we're doing a lot of advocacy at the local level, at the state level, across the deep south, trying to encourage governors and state legislators to take responsibility for the growing unaffordability of housing across every part of the country. There's also community organizing. It's, it's really kind of amazing that when you take the time to organize in communities, communities who might feel upset or frustrated by the presence of people who are unhoused people on the streets might become more understanding and push together for answers to those problems if they are brought in to solve the problems rather than think of it as an, somebody who's not affected by it. So community organizing is important. I also think there's a huge challenge in public narrative. We all know that the way that the media often talks about problems of the unhoused feeds this notion of associating unhoused populations with criminality. If we can start to change that narrative, if we can ask tough questions of those who promote that narrative, it can actually help to open people's minds to a different way of looking at the problem. Just a couple more questions. Yes. Um, so on the theme of optimism and examples of cities that have tried to and are likely to try to incorporate more human rights lenses through addressing some of these problems. But it also feels as if simultaneously, more cities are increasingly adopting things like hostile architecture, right? Or, I mean, even in Boston, where there's now fencing around certain areas where you know that certain individuals who face housing insecurity and homelessness usually are, right? And you can see, I mean, the other day I was driving down and there were actually, um, uh, I'm gonna call them bulldozers, but that's not what it was, but it, physically moving people's stuff out of the way. And then the very next day there was temporary, so fencing. So what are we, how do, what is the way in which we try to address some of that, right? What are, what are, how are you thinking about some of those things? Because it's not just affecting these communities we've been talking about today, it's affecting individuals with disabilities, right? It's affecting just everyday folks who are trying to, you know, go about their life and they're finding that they don't have benches to sit on, right? Or their accessibility is blocked. And so this has so much of a domino effect. And so I guess I'm just putting it out there, right? We did, we're seeing more of that. Um, so what are some of the things that we could be doing or thinking about? Those are great points. Thank you so much for the question. And I, I, it, was, it was a great question and I'm, I don't wanna butcher it by trying to remember all of it, but essentially it is a question about with all the increasing ways in which cities are trying to make their, uh, their sites unwelcoming, not only for the unhoused, but for people with disabilities or people who have mobility issues or, or anything, and it's such an important question. You know, um, even though Eleanor Roosevelt, after I read Carol Anderson's book, I, I was so horrified that I had previously really, you know, thought the world of Eleanor Roosevelt and now my 
technique, my perspective has changed, but she did say that human rights start at home. And I really believe that. Most human rights issues are affected most at mm -hmm. the local level, right? Everything we've talked about today, housing policy is really not set by HUD. It's set by your local mayor and city council or your county officials. We have to bring this struggle to them. Trust me, none of them know what human rights obligations are. It's a, it's a real hard struggle, but even just a conversation about why they think that will solve the problems. Mm -hmm. How does that help people who have mobility issues or who are unhoused? You're not solving problems, you're making them worse. And if we work together with local officials, I actually do believe, I am at my heart an optimist. Mm -hmm. I do believe that people actually want to make things better, especially I believe most people in government. So we have to find ways to help them do it better. And usually that starts with education, attending a city council meeting and asking questions about a really bad design of a construction project or an intentional pushing of people outside of public spaces, asking questions why and asking what the city or the neighborhood is going to do to make it more welcoming and inclusive of everyone who should who should have access. Thanks. Thank you. Sorry, we're all out of time for questions, but thank you all for those who asked. And thank you again. I want to thank everyone who's here today and everyone who's here with us on Zoom. Um, Margaret, thank you so much for your inspiring words today. Um, that was an amazing speech that you gave. Um, and I just wanted to say that on behalf of Fergie, on behalf of the Black Law Students Association, your presence today means so much to us. Um, so I'm honored to present you with this year's um, keynote speech. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, a little more, all right. Yeah, yeah. All right. Turn that. Look at the there you go. Uh, sorry, look at the more. <laughs> there you go. No. Big smiles. It's not we're just about done. If you could bear with us one more yeah, time, I you have a big Okay. And now before we turn it to Mr. Christian Lamar for his closing remarks, on behalf of Balsa, we wanted to just um, say to Elizabeth Enon, we thank you so much for all that you do for the law school, for Fergie, for Balsa. It has been a pleasure working with you. You have such a beautiful soul. And so we would like to present you with some flowers. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you for your patience. I would now like to turn it to Mr. Christian Lamar for the closing remarks. As my co-chair has shared with you all earlier, Mr. Lamar was Valerie Gordon's classmate at Newsel, class of 93, and also a fellow BALSA member. His activism and courage, along with Valerie Gordon's, helped to put in place so much of what the Newsel community benefits from today. Mr. Lamar has worked as a public defender since 1994 and specializes in representing indigent capital defendants at the pretrial and trial level. He currently serves as the supervising attorney of the Metro Capital Defender. He is a member of the faculty at the National Criminal Defense College, and he is a veteran of the US Army in which he served for six and a half years. I also want to emphasize again that he is currently in the middle of trial, so we are so <laughs> grateful to him for making the time to be with us today. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Mr. Lamar. Thank, thank you very much. Can everybody hear me all right? Yes. Oh, great, great. Uh, just first off, uh, thanks to everyone. Uh, hey, Dean Hackney. I see Brooke, uh, for folks who are in the, Brooke, Brooke Baker actually hired uh, Valerie and I as TAs after, oh, you know, we uh, kind of tore up the law school. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but it's progress and it's interesting. Um, just want to also thank Balsa um, and the co-chairs, uh, Tamia and Marissa. That was wonderful recounting of history. You took me back there. I mean, literally, you took us back uh, to that time in 91. And uh, Elizabeth, thank you very much. Uh, Antoinette, thank you. And Margaret, I just want you to know, great presentation. Valerie was a intern with in Montgomery from 1991 to 1992, that winter quarter at Southern Poverty Law Center. So this whole program is coming full circle. She was at SPLC and I was at uh, EJI under Brian Stevenson from the winter of 91, 92. So that legacy is, you know, has come full circle, but so has the continued battle. It is an eternal battle. Some of the same things, things that we were dealing with back in 91, 92, 93, we are dealing with today, but it's beautiful to see that um, folks are continuing to struggle just like Valerie and to not only struggle, but to struggle and win. Um, and also Margaret, let's just say Roper, uh, we wrote a brief on it uh, a few <laughs> weeks ago in this case where I have a young black man uh, who is, uh, right now 26, but 19 at the time of the alleged crime, who the state of Georgia is trying to um, kill. We're in the middle of uh, jury selection and it's been pretty intense. We start back on uh, Monday. So we definitely need to talk. Uh, we have been arguing Roper and we've been citing international law, the UN covenant on human rights in each one of our cases. And we continue to do that. Um, again, I'm gonna, just say a few more things and I'm going to turn it over to my sister-in-law. I'd like for her to say something to Valerie's sister, but I am so thankful for, for Northeastern, for Newsom. I am thankful for uh, being uh, part of that legacy of Balsa, Kemet chapter. And it is a blessing always um, to either be there uh, in person or to be there um, virtually. So, um, you guys keep up the great work. Thank you on behalf of my son and all of the members of the Gordon family uh, for continuing to honor Valerie's legacy with this critical and very uh, important lecture every year. So I wanna turn it over to my sister-in-law, Dr. Carolyn Gordon right now.
Unmute yourself, Carol. Unmute, unmute yourself, sis. Wow, you all missed all the good things I just said. So, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Christian. It's so good seeing you via the airwaves. And to uh, my regards to Dean Hackney, to Elizabeth, um, and to all involved, you all, again, has done a phenomenal job. I'd like to thank uh, Margaret Wong, I'm going to get that name right, uh, for your presentation and just for the reminder um, that the work um, needs to continue. Very happy to be with you. Kristen didn't tell you. We do have another member of our family. Faluke is a father uh, wow. of two. And the last child uh, is a girl named Valerie. Yes. Oh. So the legacy. Uh, the legacy continues. Also, we have, as a family, have been in conversation. And uh, I appreciate so much the presentation and the, and just the, the entire writing um, presentation on my sister. Of course, it made me miss her more. But what we've decided that we probably need to do is to put together either an, an, anth an anthology or a written work of all of us who remember Valerie and our encounters so that we can have a complete work and uh, really get you familiar with who she is beyond what you already know, even as you present it. Many don't know that before Valerie came to law school, she was also an urban fellow and got her master's in public um, policy and administration. She um, staffed the, uh, she was senior budget analyst for the state of Kansas. And before that, she was, uh, she staffed the Black Caucus of Missouri. So uh, her work goes so much more. And in the midst of that, she gave it all up to come to law school because she knew and wanted to do more. So uh, let me just encourage any of you all who think about quitting right now or dropping out, don't do that. Fight the good fight. Okay. Um, the hardest, I'm almost at, um, I teach at Mississippi Valley State, so I know what students are going through. And I just want to encourage you, fight the good fight. Uh, there's so much more that needs to be done, and you are the one who needs to do some of it. So again, I, I thank all of you. And just, Margaret, keep up the good work. Keep the fight going, knowing that we're all rooting for you. Thank you again, Dean Hackney. I'm going to be there next next year yeah. i got a knee replacement but if i have to walk to boston on this new knee i'm coming so i wish you all godspeed and again thank you for all that you do have a great day all right thank you everyone this concludes our program um, you can follow us outside we have a reception for you all here in person thank you for everyone on zoom it has been a pleasure.